Homer, this is your physician, Dr. Julius Hibbert. Can you tell us what it's like in there? Um, it's like, uh, did anyone see the movie Tron? No. 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 Yes. I mean, I mean, no. No. All right, Musicians Movie Club, episode four. What up? We are here with Gosh Diggity. Yeah. Hello. We got Joe and Cheryl in the house. We got Tommy Kessler. Hello, that is me. And we're here to discuss a film that I'll let uh, Joe introduce. The film is called Walt Disney's A Tron Story, coming out in 1982, starring Jeff Bridges and others. Why did you pick Tron? Um, it's a good question. Um, so Cheryl and I were brainstorming movies, um, while we were on a recent weekender. All right, talk about, talk about why you picked Tron. I was, I was going to, I was getting there. Okay. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and we were going back and forth with movies we wanted to watch and I wanted to rewatch Tron cause I haven't seen it in about a million years. Um, but it was my favorite movie when I was a child. Uh, I love Tron growing up. I watched it all the time when I was sick. Hell yeah. Uh, I dressed up as Tron for Halloween when I was in second grade. Um, and it was just one of my favorite films that I had not seen in a hot second. Um, and then I also realized that there was a tie-in with Tron and Cheryl. So then when Joe said that Tron was uh, his childhood favorite movie, I thought that was pretty funny because I had never seen that film before. Yet, um, in the 11th grade, that was my nickname for most of the year a lot of people didn't know my real name they just called me tron well do you, is there a backstory to that or yeah there just... is so uh, sorry uh um <laughs> that tron arena. getting really choked up <laughs> this uh yeah this tron cocktail is um anyway so like at the beginning of the school year 13 years ago uh on like the second day of school i wore a t-shirt that said Tron on it and it was it was glow in the dark mm -hmm. um and then the third day of school so I had moved okay this is too much backstory probably no go for it we got all the time in the world all right all right all right so I moved to Illinois from Virginia uh, at the beginning of 11th grade <laughs> <laughs> um and so I didn't know anyone and so I was like cool new kid in a new school Second day of school, I wore the Tron shirt. Third day of school, I wore some other shirt, but then some other kid uh, came up to me <laughs> in gym class and was like, hey, can I call you Tron? And I was like, yeah, sure. Did you see me yesterday? And he was like, yeah, I saw you yesterday. So I'm going to call you Tron. And then he introduced me to all his friends as Tron. And then I made a lot of friends who only knew me as Tron. And then I moved to Florida in the middle of the year. TLDR, Cheryl wore a Tron shirt. Yeah, we can cut <laughs> no, 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 no. I so I'm trying to think if I've ever worn a T-shirt for a movie I've never seen before. That was yeah. How did you get the shirt? Yeah, what's the back? I want all the backstory. <sighs> you want all the do you no? Do you remember? <laughs> I guess just do you. <laughs> do you remember where you got the shirt? Uh, Hot Topic. Nice. And it glowed in the dark, and that's why I bought it. Speaking of things that might glow in the dark, um, Dan, do you want to talk about our cocktail for tonight? Because you made it this time. Some of our listeners at home may know that in my professional life, I am a bartender and I work at a very prominent margarita bar. And when we were trying to come up with a cocktail for this piece of cinema, we gave up. <laughs> no, 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 no. Uh, I, someone mentioned to me, was it you who mentioned like a, a blue margarita, blue Rita or cubby Rita or whatever? I, I was just looking at stuff that was blue, I think. But I think you also independently were looking at things that were blue. Yeah, and somebody mentioned a, a, a blue margarita, which essentially involves swapping orange curacao for blue curacao. But I made it in the fashion of how I would at the unnamed prominent margarita bar in Chicago that I am employed by. Um, so what we did was we got two ounces of arete reposado, Three quarter ounces of lime juice. We got half an ounce of blue curacao and a quarter ounce of simple syrup, salted rim, and then a quarter ounce of Del Maguey's Vita Puebla mezcal on top. What do you think, Tommy? It's, it's delicious. 
This is Joe, not Tommy, but it's delicious. <laughs> I uh, I kind of skinified mine. I did top it with orange vanilla club soda. Um, and how is that? It's good. I I like skinny mezcal margarita. I think is the move. Um, so yeah, this is the Tron Rita. I was expecting us to come over and just grab forks and pick an outlet and that would be the cocktail (laughs) just pure electricity baby or uh you were going to come over and i was going to install viruses on your electronic devices one or the other so this is great i'm I'm enjoying this a lot thank you good so we're happy we have the movie on the background one thing i just the first note i have on my phone because i took notes while watching this i was amazed how quickly they reveal the fact that there's a world inside the computer. Because having never seen this, in my head I was like, that's going to be a twist at the end of the first act or something. But like the very nope. first scene is just like people in the computer. Yep. And I was like, oh, they're not, okay. Tron, We're maybe. just jumping in. <laughs> um, really surprised me. And I thought that was an interesting choice to just show your hand like that, I no, guess. No, they, they cut right to it, um, which I, I love. I love that most of the movie takes place inside the computer right from the get. There's like, you know, it's maybe like 90-10 in terms of in the computer versus in real life. Um, And I kind of love that, like, right at the beginning, they're like, by the way, (laughs) computer, (laughs) we're in it, you know? There's not, they don't don't hold your hand in this film. No. No, we kick it off and we're like, all right, here's the deal. Software, they're people. Um, Programs, lines of code, they exist as people. And also they look like the people in the real world who program them. Yeah, they do. Yeah. And there's a ton of like rules and stuff. It actually is pretty mind blowing how look like looking back from us in a 2023 perspective, I was like someone who knows what like, you know, how like data works on a basic level just, and, and a lot of us, you know, use computers and we kind of understand. I don't. Tommy has exclusively been using like an abacus, abacus I was yeah. Gonna say, yeah yeah um anyway so we we kind of have a grasp of like some of the basic you know workings of how like computers work but this is like 1982 like when computers must have been kind of just becoming visible to like the people at large and this is such a detailed like crazy like there's so many like rules and like, I don't know. They were way ahead of their time with that. And they were not holding your hand, which I think is really cool. Yeah. I remember as a kid, a lot of the watching it recently, a lot of kind of the, like Ram, you know, was like, he's like, Oh, Hey, I'm Ram. I feel like as a kid, I didn't get that. And I'm like, oh, 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 Ram. <laughs> and they had like some, <laughs> you know, like thank I don't know. They had some other like kind of hokey lines in there that I feel like totally went over my head that I feel like when this movie came out, definitely wouldn't have been like, so on the nose and i feel like watching it now in the age of tiktok and smartphones it's like so funny like yeah they definitely they had that was like ingrained into the script and like every line and kind of in the computer world was very much like yeah like self-referencing computer stuff yeah well even all the ai like the fact that the villain of this movie is like an evil ai I, I mean, the second I kind of realized that I was like, oh, that's every movie now. Yeah, we, we <laughs> talked about that when it because I forgot about that, too. When like it, the scene that's currently playing Dillinger talking to the master control program, I was like, wow, this like is still very pertinent. It's so funny that this is like an evil AI trying to take over the world. <laughs> like that's just like, yeah, some things never change. What's There's going on to be an evil AI somewhere? I wonder what movie it started with. Tron. For, uh I want. To, uh, I don't know if it's two thousand one, but yeah, two thousand one yeah. is probably probably a good. When did that come out, Tommy? I'm sure you know the date. Nineteen sixty eight. Sixty eight. This is the second time we've talked about two thousand one on the podcast, though. Yeah. So what happens in two thousand one <laughs> is, uh... and this won't be the last time. I'm <laughs> no, sure. I have a note about Kubrick on my phone regarding mm-hmm. this movie that we can get to at some point, but it basically is. What would Kubrick have thought? Like, did Kubrick see Tron? And what did he think when they have the weird Stargatey sequence when Jeff Bridges is like sucked into the grid? Yeah, because it's basically the same thing, just made with computers instead of however Kubrick did it. And I was like, mm. well, the cool thing. Okay, so let me let me say this about: Have you guys read anything about how this was shot and made? I, I was reading it, so, I was, and I also want to say that the scene where he gets sucked in the computer holds up. I think that effect oh. looks great. So yeah, when he's like. Uh, yeah, he turns into a grid and then is sucked in is awesome. So yeah, and I'll talk, I have a, a, so yeah, so I think, I guess let me, I think the entire movie holds up and this is why. So <laughs> I feel like anyone who's watched this recently, it looks like you're watching like 
you know, I don't know, someone play Roblox on like 280p, <laughs> like is the computer effects. But like the cool thing about the stuff that's all like quote unquote CG, like the scenes or the light bike scenes or wow, or like with the tank, you know, roaming in the data sphere, whatever, like that stuff is, if you were to shoot a movie today about being inside a 1980s computer, that's how it should look. Like that's the graphics of what a 1980s computer would look like. So I feel like the stuff that looks really remedial, like kind of just makes sense for what it is. Um, and then I think the stuff where it has live action characters, it's so like, I feel like you could totally remake that and it would just be like an interesting artistic choice. Like shooting it in like, you know, mono, like black and white, and then kind of having all this sort of weird like mix of like, um, practical effects and like kind of overlaid CG like it kind of reminds me of Guillermo del Toro like I feel like the stuff where there's humans interacting with that world like if you were to just do a shot for shot remake it would just seem like a really cool sort of choice that they made so I think the entire movie holds up even like if you were to watch Pirates of the Caribbean for example um, which I don't know if anyone has recently the I CGI I want to watch the second one really bad I've been thinking about it if I continue the CGI is rough, and I yeah. watched it maybe like in high school, and I remember watching when they turned into like spooky skeletons. It's like skeleton watch. That's a skeleton watch moment for our fans at home. A skeleton watch moment. I don't know what that is, but yes, <laughs> it's it's like kind of not good, and I feel like because they're going for realism, and I feel like at the time going for these super realistic shots with CG just wasn't feasible, and I feel like they did it in like an artistic way that was interesting. And yeah. the stuff that was supposed to just be totally CG makes sense because you're inside a computer and that's like what it would look like. So that's my, that's my bit on Tron is still, still holds up. So, well, that's a, that actually brings up a question I have for the group, but it's a question that I think the filmmakers would probably have to answer, but I'm curious as to y'all's interpretations. Um, how much of the aesthetic of this movie do you think was dictated by what computers were able to do versus them? Like this was the vision from the get go. Does that make sense? Yeah. I think so. I think it's like both. I don't know. I, I read a, I read a bit about it. So I think this was one of the first movies ever to prominently feature CGI in yeah. like its totality. It's super groundbreaking when it came out. Um, but I still think like all the scenes that were CGI, they weren't computer animated because you could not computer animate at the time. They were drawn on the computer, but they were still filmed on film. Oh. So like a lot of the stuff where they're in, it's like backlit animation. They're filmed on kodak black and white large format film but then they have to do passes over top of it like overlaying these cells that they've made so some scenes took like 50 times passing over it to like film it and i feel like I, I, there was one example of like they got they had to order like literal tons like truckloads of film to film it and the speeds varied from batch to batch so there's actually like flickering in some of the beginning scenes that they just put sound effects over like see you yeah. that's because they just got the speeds wrong and there's just like <laughs> interference um but i do think that like i don't know it, it was an artistic choice from to to, to from the get-go but i i feel like no one making this film probably knew exactly how it was going to turn out because it was so groundbreaking i was i was reading a lot about the production because it's extremely unique um and super cool like the the computer stuff like it took me a second to like really recognize like oh they are the actors are in black and white like fully yeah and yeah. and um and I was reading about that that process and that I was like damn that looks that sounds so difficult <laughs> um and then like things like yeah the computers that they actually did all the computer effects on are like like I think I read it was something like they had four megabytes of memory or something and it's like Same. yeah and like that's another thing where it's again like the difference in this technology then to now is like impossible to even fathom. I was also reading the, they, it was nominated for two Oscars for one, um, which was surprising, which was costume design and score, I think. Was visual, effects, was visual effects not a thing yet? They were disqualified because they didn't think computer effects Yo. were legitimate. What? And, I love that. And then uh, I think I think there was also like a lot of the it, Disney like hand animators were like pissed because they were like you're this kind of a, a technology is going to take our jobs, and of course in a few decades it kind of did because there's not really two D Disney stuff anymore, and I think they I was reading that they even discontinued that par that part of Disney, and then it was eventually brought back at the behest of uh, John Lasseter who was the head of Pixar, which is probably like 
you know, obviously Disney's number one yeah. computer effects thing. So I, I, I find that fast. Did, did it win any of those Oscars or no? No. I, I, I talked about the score a little bit when we were watching it. I love the score. I think it's so great. I, I also think, wanted to talk about the score. This is I, good. I think it's interesting because the, the Tron legacy is all Daft Punk. Yeah. Which I think is great. And I feel like this totally could have done like a John Carpenter sort of like synthy score. But I love that it's just sort of like a straight up like Indiana Jones adventure score. Like I feel like yeah. just really fun that it's I, just sort of like analog instruments and stuff. Yeah. I went back and forth because they do incorporate the synths a little bit. Mm-hmm. And Wendy Carlos did the score who is also of Clockwork Orange and Shining fame, helped do the scores for both of those. And I'm obsessed with her. She's amazing, an icon, Wendy Carlos. And part of me was like, what? (laughs) Get her on the podcast. (laughs) I think she's still alive. I looked it up. So we can, yeah. yeah. So come on, podcast. Skeleton skeleton gang. Come on. Wendy Carlos. (laughs) Come on, Skeleton Watch, and please (laughs) talk to me about synthesizers and how they work because I don't understand them. Um, Part of me wanted the score to lean into the synths a little more. And that might be because I'd only seen Tron Legacy before this and loved how they kind of married um, a traditional score with the synths uh, and favored the synths a little more heavily. But I get where you're coming from. But I don't know. It just, like, made this movie feel more Disney in a way, doing the more Indiana Jones-style score, which I think makes sense given the time. But I think they could have done something really weird that would have been fun as well. I definitely think that would have been super, super cool. But it would have been a different, it would have felt like a very different movie, I feel like. It would have. And I I think that would have worked and definitely would have been interesting. But I I feel, and maybe part of it is just because I remember the score so fondly as a kid. Um, But I do love the music still. I still think it's a great score and I love that it was nominated. But I do think it would have been, yeah, it would have been cool if they, they, they did that for sure. It sounds like a John Williams score to me. Like the, it's got like those like bassoons or, or clarinets or something that's like very characteristic of his, his music, you know. And I, I I also like the whole time I was like, I think Disney was trying to hit a, a Star Wars payday. I had that same thought. <laughs> yeah, and like especially because obviously it's I mean it's this crazy fantasy sci fi adventure um, with all these new rules and this new world and. Um, and it's just like the right time, the right place. Like they can produce the arcade game that's based off the movie to, to really hit the, you know, the revenue and everything, which I, I read that they did and it made way more money than the movie did. Light bikes did. Yeah. The, like whatever game, the Tron yeah. arcade game. Of, that's so funny. Um, but yeah, I, I think it's very, the, it's very star Wars, except for the fact that all the main characters are just adults you know like <laughs> it's just like the, all the real world stuff is just it's, like honestly it's like a kind of mature angle of like you know sh- the the i don't remember her Lori. name Lori and Flynn used to be together and now she's with um Alan uh, real Tron real Tron Alan Tron um and they're like you know there's kind of this like character angle of like it's like a little love triangle yeah. and um and it's like this is all very adult kind of and then the movie is like clearly trying to be like a fun family adventure story sorry we're, we're at the point in the movie where jeff bridges takes off his shirt for no reason I thought, um what am i <laughs> he is very sweaty and for playing video games from playing video games <laughs> and i i thought he was too hot for this role is one of my notes i wanted to also take just a point that i feel like we know jeff bridges from like true grit and crazy heart and the big lebowski and like smoke show in tron like i love that like they put in a bit of the script where he literally takes off a blue flynn shirt shows his abs and then puts on a black flynn shirt like, <laughs> totally not not necessary at all but like yeah. just hot jeff bridges yeah. he was gaming bro he was and then he, he takes out a game boy which i love and he's just like gaming yeah he's just like the hot nerd uh you know the i don't know big fan i actually like i so I I've, I had not seen this movie until this podcast oh, opportunity, um, but I was a huge Tron Legacy fan. Really? Okay. Yeah. Like when it came out, I I didn't know what that was. I knew that my dad loved Jeff Bridges mm-hmm. um, from Big Lebowski fame, uh, etc. And I went with my brother and my dad and we saw Tron Legacy and I was like obsessed with it. That score is like top tier shit. Yeah. Um, the and the remix album, album the D Res remix that song goes so hard well and apparently daft punk were like inspired by the og tron sure yeah 
like they you know like their aesthetics like, yeah yeah like that they there's a bit on the wikipedia about them like talking about like the og tron which is great that they came back and did the the legacy score yeah and the uh so the funny thing about the like I was kind of looking for here is that in Tron Legacy, Jeff Bridges' performance is very like he's kind of being the dude, you know, like he's like older and like he's kind of like he's there's a line where he goes bio digital jazz, man. <laughs> and I'm like looking for that in this movie. And it's not really there. <laughs> like like Jeff Bridges just kind of became that character in real life. And then he was like, I'm just going to do this all the time. Um, but they are actually pretty similar movies. They both have these kind of. They both have some similar sequences. We get the bike, the bike games, and breaking out uh, of the of the bike arena, and then the the disc fight. Um, which I guess in this one, it's more like a what is that called? That like Identity scoop. Disc? Well, they have that big oh, scoop oh, yeah, thing. Oh yeah, play the scoop game. Um, they also have these themes of like in this one, it's the big the big bad AI. Um, in Tron Legacy, um, the bad guy, um, which is Clue who's actually goes away after the first few scenes in this movie, which I didn't, I thought he was way more important character in this, but he's not. Um, Clue becomes basically a, fa- a, a digital fascist nice. uh, in the, in Tron legacy. And then this one it's the AI like taking over. And there's also some, I'm going to throw this one to Tommy, but there's some um, thematic elements in here about like r- spirituality. I think there's like some religious oppression themes for sure. Let me see what my note said on my phone. Um, Cause I wrote, so the, there's a religious angle that they don't commit to, but just kind of like sprinkle throughout. Because like in the early, there's early on a scene where they're talking about like, oh, users have to be real. Like, you know, the users being a substitute for some sort of, you know, God or deities or whatever you want to call them. Um, and I was like, oh, is the movie going to be about that? And I started to lose my shit. Like, this is going to be crazy. Like this religious allegory is told through this computer wondering if they have creators. And, and they, it's not what the movie's about at all. Um, it's just kind of like, (laughs) they just kind of sprinkle it in there, but there's a scene later where, um, Jeff Bridges reveals to Tron, I believe that there are users. I think it's to, to Ram. To Ram? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. To Ram then, um, that like, oh, I'm one of them and we do exist. And then Ram is like, oh, so you guys are following a plan, right? And Jeff Bridges is like, nope. And Ram is totally fine with that. They don't address it. And I'm like, if I fucking met God and God was like, oh, I'm just improvising. That would be the most like, if I like believed in God and thought that there was a plan and then learned that there wasn't, I'd like have a panic attack. And Ram is so cool with it. I was like, what? That could have been the whole movie right there. In, in Ram's defense, I think he died like three seconds after that. So I, I, I think, I think it's mortally like later, wounded. Then I think this is Tron later in the movie then. I think this might be Tron later in the movie. Because I, I think, okay, I think the scene you're no, think thinking you're right. about is is when uh, Jeff Bridges is able to operate the like stomper machine. And mm-hmm. Ram's like, I didn't think that you could do that. And then he's like yo i'm a user and then ram dies maybe I'm there's wrong. another scene later okay. where tron and um jeff bridges er, and flynn are talking um and I, I think yeah flynn reveals he's a user and tron is like asking him like a question about it and the question is like what plan are you following essentially mm-hmm. i could be misremembering i watched it a couple days ago but i was also very high but i think um that was kind of the gist of it is like Tron really didn't seem phased by the fact that his quote unquote God was just making it up as he went along. And that blew my mind. So I was really hoping that would be like a big like turning point. And then it just, they kind of shrug it off. He's basically, he basically, I think he says something like, so you're following a plan, right? Yeah. And then, um, and then he's like, nah, man, I'm just kind of making it up as I go along. And then, yeah, I think it is Tron. And he's like, he's like, we, that's, that's how it is to be. He's like, you know how, that is and then tron's like yeah i just figured that the users weren't like us he's like well we're just like that and it's just like what <laughs> i was like <laughs> they were like uh because i also thought maybe the logic would be that like if you're a program that you have like certain defined rules and stuff but i guess not really the case because everybody's kind of like a sentient guy that can like drive a motorcycle etc yeah i don't know i do think that the when in the very beginning when Jeff Bridges Flynn writes his hacker program. Yeah. I think there is a pretty big duality between Flynn in the real world and when he's in the computer versus the program that he writes, even in like their mannerisms. Yeah. Like, I don't know if you caught that even just watching it again, like when Flynn's hacker program like sits down at the computer, he like spins around, he's kind of very like whatever. And then like, you know, Flynn is very 
I don't know, kind of bombastic and whatever. So I do feel like their their programs are still kind of like robotic in kind yeah. of a weird way. Um, even though Alan is like Tron is way cooler than Alan is in real life. So yeah. that's kind of the opposite of that. <laughs> but yeah, no, it, uh, Clue is like the first of the programs that you see that is like an analog of a person. And yeah, he's like, it took me a second. I was like, is that also Jeff Bridges just being goofier? And like and then yeah yeah Tron is like the the bad boy version of Alan yeah he doesn't have glasses that's how you know he's a bad yeah, boy. yeah exactly <laughs> he was also called Tron in high school yeah yeah Tron was called Tron in high school yeah uh, I want to give this microphone to Cheryl to bring up the next talking point because I know that they have some burning issues on their mind um I don't but um, <laughs> I will say uh. Expanding on the whole, this is probably a religious uh, metaphor thing. I think maybe what it was getting at um, is that instead of there being one single God, like, you know, the master control program was trying to have everyone believe that, you know, he was the God and there was only one, is that, in fact, we are all our own gods and we have our own users in the form of, like, a higher consciousness. And we are all just like, you know, programs kind of following our reflexes because we were all built with this DNA uh, that we uh, can't control necessarily and we're just winging it. But if we contact our higher consciousness, maybe they'll give us the answers. The answers. I I go back and forth on... <laughs> that was really good. That was really good. <laughs> um, what is the role... Cause Yes, but also there are literal users like playing the game. And I got so confused as to like the allegory when it came to like, okay, but somebody's actually playing it sometimes. <laughs> like, I don't know the relationship there, you know? Mm. What do you, what do you, wait, mean? are people, wait, are there people, like when people, when, pe- when people are playing the video game actually, like what is, what's, what's the implication there? I don't, I don't, I don't think they're it, playing the, the programs. Oh, is the program separate from the like arcade game? I think so. Yeah. 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 Oh. The programs are, are pre-programmed to, to do what they're going to do. And they get appropriated by MCP and put into the, to the games. But I, I feel like when you're playing the games, you're not actually like controlling the, the thing. It's not really explained, but okay. that was my interpretation. Gotcha. Yeah. I, had, I had something backwards. I think Jeff Bridges just imagine it's actually the opening monologue of um, Front Legacy, where he's like, the grid, a digital frontier. I tried to picture how things moved in the computer. What do they look like? Highways, motorcycles. <laughs> and I, like, I, uh, so I think he did that. And then he was like, oh, and he designed the game. That makes sense. I think that's how it went down. I was very confused thinking there were still users out there sometimes controlling these people. We were watching the movie and I'm like, so there are literal users because people are playing the game right now. Okay, I just wasn't paying close enough attention. I was very confused for parts of this movie. I will admit that. Same. I I, I do think, though, um, the plot is really, it's like, it's pretty loosey-goosey. Like, again, I love this movie as a kid, and I probably didn't grasp half of this. Like, I feel like it's really just kind of like a fun spectacle, and like kind of the rest is sort of just like... You know, I don't know. Yeah, like I was, me and Tommy were talking about it, and it's like about halfway through the movie, I did get a little lost, and a part of it is because like the the environments that they're in, like sometimes like there will be two shots in the same scene, they look like they're completely different worlds, and I'm just kind of like, whoa. Okay, we're watching the, the moment when he gets sucked in the computer. That's pretty. Good. That looks That's sick. So good. That's really good. Yeah. No, it's super cool. And again, I feel like the fact that all of this wasn't necessarily, it was computer generated, but not CGI as we know it, as in like animated on a computer, but it was like, you know, it's still, all of this was like filmed on film being like kind of like overlays. And as your, as your point earlier, it was shot in black and white and all the actors were just in black boxes, which is so cool. Oh, here's not Stargate. We, we made it to the not Stargate sequence. It looks like the Windows Media Player visualizer. Yeah, dude. <laughs> Shout out to the real ones. I used to come up from school and just watch that. <laughs> like hours. So good. Oh uh, yeah, no this 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 stuff in the in the moment when he gets sucked in the computer. There's like it's like this big globe looking thing with all these like grids. That kind of looks like an Evangelion image to me. It's like yeah, these are like truly insane visuals. 
And there's there's some shots later on too that are kind of almost like static shots. Like I don't know if you remember when they were trying to get to like the maybe it was when Tron and and Yori were trying to get to like the input output port and it just shows kind of like all the cables like running and it's just sort of like a static shot and it looks like um like a 2D animation from like a like a Disney movie. Like there's some really cool I don't know, it's such it's such a fever dream. Um and kind of this weird mix of practical and you know, CGI effects, but then also kind of like hand drawn, cell shaded animation. It's such a cool vibe. Um, I don't know. Again, like, I think, like, looking at this right now, if we were to like remake this, you know, today, I feel like this would just be like interesting artistic choice. Like, this could yeah. totally pass as just something like people doing something kind of cool. Um, I feel like a lot of it still ages really well. And then this, again, I feel like, yeah, if you're going to make a movie inside an 80s computer, it's going to look just like, you know, polygons. Yeah. Fever Dream does sound like a very good descriptor. Like, I feel like I'll probably have nightmares about this at some point. Good. The Im- Yeah, the images of the Master Control guy's face are insane. He's warping. Yeah. Like, disintegrating. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so do you, do you think that there... Was there only one IO port in this whole place? I feel like I feel like when when you're looking at the world, all those like beams coming out of it, I feel like it's kind of there's a bunch of different IO ports, and they were just going to like the one in their continent. Oh, okay. So do you, so how many IO ports do you think exist in the world of drawing? Like six. I don't know. <laughs> I just want to know. Okay, do we think that there is one IO port to access the users, or do you think that every single person has their own IO port that they have to go discover? I feel like it seems like just any IO port is an input output. They can like contact, you know, they can reach the outside servers. So like, so it could be like an aux port, like a, like a flash drive quarter inch, like, a th- like a lightning. Yeah. Any of those like a power kick power XLR on a focus, right? Scarlet like a like floppy disk solid state. Someone might jump out of one of our microphones at any moment. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> How do you think, um, what was his name? Oh, Tron. <laughs> uh, how do you think he found the exact IO port to reach Alan? Like, how do you know that Alan was at the other side of this one port? Well, I think, I th- okay, this is, this is my interpretation. I think that, like, any sort of IO port, if you put your identity disk into it, it retrieves information that's supposed to be sent to that program. So, like, Alan is contacting Tron via his output his input output from his computer but the program needs to get to an input output to receive that information via his identity disk that is sort of how it happens in legacy too like jeff bridges disk was the way that they could get out specifically i also think that with this discussion we're putting the world under a microscope that it wasn't intended to be put under but that makes (laughs) it more fun (laughs) tear apart the world of tron much like the Bible, you got to kind of fill in some gray areas, you know? Yeah. It's like, did they really want us to think about this logically? Something that was cool, though, is like, there's all the aesthetics that happen in the computer world with these like neon lines and and things. And um, there's that is also kind of present in a lot of the stuff in the real world scenes, too. Like the I was like the the shot of the helicopter coming into the building and it's like got all those like red neon lights on it and i was like it didn't have to be like that but it was and that's sick well and i feel like there's that great shot of it's like transitioning to the computer world and then it blends into like the nighttime city skyscape of like the highways and all the lights and stuff i feel like they do a couple sort of fading cuts like that where i'm like oh i'm picking up what you're putting down you know (laughs) also i love how soft uh specifically um Skark or whatever his name is, his <laughs> costume feels it just looks like just like foam paper. All the guys who have the orange, like all the bad guys with the orange costumes, like they're all like a little not the right fit for them. Yeah. Like the the um, just got like one size Tyvek suits. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I was looking up some things about the director. What is, what else has the director done? Do you That's know? Yeah, I didn't do a lot of research on his filmography. I didn't think to. I just assumed that Tron was like his life's work, and then he gave up. I don't know why I assumed that, but this seems like something that you'd spend I mean, your whole life thinking about. If I made Tron, I would stop trying afterwards. <laughs> if you make one perfect movie, 
why keep going? You're not going to do better. So what's the point? All right. It would appear that his all right. So his name is Steve Lisberger. Steven Lisberger. Um, first feature film was called Animal Olympics. <laughs> And it's a 2D film that involves a bunch of animals at what appears to be an Animal Olympics. Tight. Yeah. Stop there. Yeah. Yeah, we're lucky to have Tron. Yeah, really. But it does look like he likes games and things um, from that. Um, And then came Tron and then a movie called Hot Pursuit Mm. with um, Chicago native John Cusack. Oh, lovely. um, Jerry Stiller, Robert Loggia, Ben Stiller. Keith David, star studded. They they were putting their money on my man Lisberger. Is, is that just like a like what does Hot Pursuit look like? Um, just like a buddy cop movie. Let me read. It's should I read the synopsis or guess based on this? Both. I want Cheryl to guess. Okay, yeah. yeah there you go. Oh my god! What? Wait, what am I guessing? The, what's what's the plot? The plot of this movie, Hot Pursuit, based on the poster, which is I'm um, gonna describe the poster. It is a woman sucking on a straw, looking through binoculars at from I can't quite see it looks like Shelley Duvall but I think that's that. John Cusack John <laughs> Cusack <laughs> I've always mistaken the two I think it's it's um a bird watching movie mm, nice mm. Joe Core because yeah, the, the person in the binoculars is also holding binoculars oh my god and I think that they went bird watching together to pursue like you know a really rare bird and then they found out that the rare bird was just them all along it was just john god i don't want it to be whatever movie it actually is someone make that movie (laughs) that's so good i don't know john cusack also looked looks a little bit like he has a gun so hold on not binoculars no he has binoculars just also a gun Mm. all right dan arrives too late for his girlfriend's family's plane to the caribbean he gets the next once the, <laughs> it ends there. Uh, once there, Dan's hot pursuit of his girlfriend includes three friendly locals, a dubious yacht skipper, corrupt police, hijacker, pirates, etc. <laughs> so it's like planes, trains, and automobiles. Like, so <laughs> it's like a travel movie. He's trying to get to his girlfriend. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. That sounds worse than bird watching. <laughs> I love that we stopped talking about Tron. We're just we're just this, checking. This is, in. this is this is related, you know. And then he made his final feature was uh, came out in 1989. It's called Slipstream, and it stars Mark Hamill and Bill Paxton. Nice. Um, in the near future, where Earth has been devastated by man's pollution and giant winds rule the planet, bounty hunter Matt kidnaps a mur- <laughs> <laughs> kidnaps a murderer out of the hands of two police officers planning to get the bounty himself. Never trust a Matt. <laughs> They they really wrote a sci fi movie and just said yeah his name's Matt yeah yeah he he literally wrote a movie like Clue Tron Scarn you know yeah. and he's like ah Matthew's good <laughs> Matt like, yeah. yeah that one also sounds kind of good too I sort of want to watch this man's he hasn't done anything since eighty nine did he did he do a he... did he do a not alive he um <laughs> did he do one yeah um he is credited as producer on tron legacy okay cool um way to go steven and yeah there's like some other random stuff but i think he's still alive tight yeah well i guess this is something we can talk about because they're doing tron 3 in the next are they years what with unfortunately jared leto as who tron i don't know bummer um i wonder if he's involved but they're doing another tron movie which is it's called tron aries i think Tron Aries with Jared Dan's nodding Leto. his head. Do you know anything about yeah, this? Yeah, I was looking this up also. Um, I don't know a lot about it. Um, Tron 3 is like in production right now. Um, Tron Aries set to star Jared Leto, Evan Peters, Greta Lee, and Jody Turner-Smith. Um, okay, this article is from August 15th, and it's a uh, quote, from the director says, we were supposed to begin our first day of principal photography on Tron Aries, a movie subsequently about AI and what it means and takes to be human. Wow. wow. Um, instead, we are shut down with over 150 people laid off. It's indefinite, which makes it exponentially harder for everyone. The AM- AMPTP, SAG after and WGA need to speed up the negotiation process and not leave the table until it's done. Wow. So it's shut down because of <clears throat> AI about a movie about AI. Yeah. That's pretty wild. Uh, Yokum Running. 
Um, and 30 Seconds to Mars is doing the soundtrack. Yes. Um, it says, Jared Leto is starring in the movie as Ari, as Ari, as Ares, Ares, the manifestation of a program that becomes sentient and crosses over into the human world. Um, of course. So it's like, it's like Tron reverse. Like the program is just, it's like, <laughs> welcome to New York. What's that? <laughs> <laughs> Tron just like trying to like order a bagel. Like, <laughs> I would love that. Honestly, that's the where you should take it. Like yeah, we did yeah. Tron Legacy where we just yeah. did like Tron with like, no, totally you know, souped up graphics yeah. and digital bridges what's Did the bridges? what's the eddie murphy movie i'm thinking about coming to america coming to america yeah, yeah it's that but tron where yeah. jared leto comes out of the computer and he's just trying to make it in like new york i think that'd be so good <sighs> jared leto why what a, what a, i'll say it what a piece of trash there it is you heard it here first yeah he's not a not he's not 100 percent kosher in my mind I, I i have no specific details it's just one of those things you know you know yeah he, I'm trying to think of anything that I've seen him in. He, well, he was good in Dallas Buyers Club, I guess. That's like the only movie that I feel like I've seen him in. Uh, where I'm Blade like, Runner 2049. Oh, was he in that? He was the villain, which was supposed to be played by David Bowie before he passed away. Was he good in that? Yeah. Yeah, he's well, like, he I wasn't guess, Bowie, but yeah. Yeah, yeah he's fine. Bowie would have been so fucking perfect for that role as the bummer of it all. Yeah. I mean, the bummer of it all is David Bowie dying. He died, right. But the other bummer of it all is that David Bowie would have been very good in Blade Runner 2049, I think. And Jared Leto like, kind of is the runner of a cult. Yeah. Maybe. Um, and he's in any 30 Seconds to Mars, which is just sort of a stain on music. <laughs> yeah, he was doing some cult stuff. Um, there was like that famous news story where like the pandemic started. And then like a month later, there was a story about how he was on an island with his cult. And he came back and he was like, wait, what? What happened here? Yeah. There's like a lot of pictures of him in like white robes with like a lot of other people in white robes in like the desert. And That's I'm like. people who live in California. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's actually just, yeah, his gated community in California. <laughs> We made it to what is the game called with the bikes? We're watching the movie. And, Light um, bike. Snake. 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 <laughs> I love the design. High stakes of snakes. Bikes. Yeah. Multiplayer. Yeah. The scene is so fun because it's like I don't know. I I love the game Snake. Oh, sorry. What what are you watching? Snake. <laughs> I'm watching the trailer to Tron, I guess. Because <laughs> I'm, I'm on the IMDb page trying to look up the trivia tab and just started playing. My bad. You're good. I just love I love how effectively they make you feel like you're inside a video game during this scene. It's just like very fun action movie vibes, but all animated. Totally. And I think that's fun. And again, I like love how low poly this is because I just feel like it makes sense. Like yeah. when you see the shots of them typing on the computer, it's literally just a command prompt screen. Like that's <laughs> like, that's the computer you're inside right now. So it makes sense that it's literally just polygons. Like, yeah. Um, I don't know. It's just fun. Here's a trivia bit for you. Jeff Bridges produced too much of a bulge in the crotch area of his computer outfit, so he was forced to wear a belt to conceal it. I love that. There's another one with, um, oh, who was it? I think, like, William Shatner in, like, Star Trek also had too much of a bulge, and they might have modified his costume. Go off. Yeah. Congrats. Way to go, guys. <laughs> um, <laughs> I also love IMDb user reviews. Um, there's one with the headline, someone had to try it. <laughs> if I did it, someone would have. Most of the reviews are like groundbreaking, put it back in theaters. This is still a, like an amazing movie. Poetical cyber adventure is what one person said. I feel it. This one's headline says, it's like you always thought. There are little people in your computer. <laughs> That's it. That's the entire <laughs> review. That was the takeaway from one user. Um, coming up here in the movie that we're currently rewatching, that is Tron, um, is probably my favorite scene, um, which is when they find Dan's blue margarita in that void. Do you oh, yeah. I think that's like, it's such a stark contrast of all this, which is just kind of like gray blocks and kind of like, whatever like not a whole lot going on and then they make it to this sort of like weird little portal not it's not a portal it's just kind of this like crevice almost that's kind of like, it's like a little pond it's like a pond it's like this sort of sanctuary and it just feels like kind of like the hub area of like a video game it's like super inviting and pretty and different and like oh i just like how cool is that um it just is such an interesting scene and and um setting 
And like thinking about how they made that with just sort of like all these passes of like, you know, throwing cells over actual film. It just is so cool. It just feels like such a cozy little area. Um, and is by far my favorite scene in the in the movie. The pond is, what is it actually? It's like power? Power source. I always just viewed it as electricity, essentially. Yeah. It's kind of like a Lovecraftian digital polygon cave. Yeah. It just, it looks really cozy for being so cold. Like I would want to like curl up in there. And like when I, I feel like when I was a kid watching this, it's like, I would love to climb around in that. Like that just seems like such like a kid's dream of like climbing around and kind of these like, it's just like a playground almost. I don't know. City Museum. I was j- yeah. literally just about to mention the city museum. <laughs> I was like, because the city museum in St. Louis has this big cave system that you can climb around in as if, if you're a child. And then I went like a little bit later when I was a teenager and I was like, I'm not made for this. I think <laughs> that was disappointing. This is basically a vaporwave city museum. Yeah. Speaking of the city museum, didn't, wasn't that guy making like concrete world and then got murdered? What? Do you not read about this? I have no idea what you're talking about, but I'm very interested. Like the guy who made the city museum was like, I'm going to make another thing called concrete world or something. Whereas like, he was like doing all these like kind of crazy concrete slabs and then like one day people found him like run over by like his own bulldozer and it's like foul play. This was like years ago. Yeah, you should I, look it up. Actually, I kind of remember Concrete World. I didn't yeah. know that the mob. Yeah, he got I, murked and people that, think that maybe it was his like wife or something. Um, he was under a bulldozer? Yeah, he got like run over by his own bulldozer and yeah, it's foul play. It's, it's like, crazy. Yeah, read his Wikipedia. It's nutty. It's like that scene in The Happening when that guy lays down in front of his lawnmower. Yeah. They're like, I can't believe what happened to Concrete World guy. What? You haven't seen, you haven't seen The uh, Happening? With Marky Mark. Oh my God, when that, when that lady's like, you're going to kill me. And he's like, what? Yeah. No. And it's supposed to be like... Plan on murdering me in my sleep? <laughs> what? what? No. no. Sounds like an I think you should leave sketch the way you're... It, it's oh, honestly, dude, it is. it's so bad. It's so, so there's bad. another scene where Zoe Deschanel plays his, uh, his wife's girlfriend. Um, and he's like telling her this thing where he's like, I went to the pharmacy the other day and I, I was, there's a real good looking pharmacist behind the counter, real good looking. And I almost bought a bottle of cough syrup just to talk to her. We're talking about a totally superfluous bottle of cough syrup. That's like six bucks. And then she goes, is that true? And then he just goes and shakes his head. <laughs> and it's like, what was the point of that? The script, that movie is the, insane. The writing in that movie is so bad. Um. So anyway, Tron, <laughs> they get drunk on Electricity Pond, kind of. I know the feeling. It just, was, they get they get hyped up. They get hype. I was thinking it was like doing coke or something, the way they're kind of like, woo, you know? Yeah, they're feeling good. They're feeling great, driving little bikes around. They're all smiling. Except R.I.P. Ram. R.I.P. Ram. About all to get domed murked. by that tank. The tanks look so cool. Did anybody else play the Tron-esque app on iPhone, Light Bike, or, or whatever? There was there was a, a, a iPhone-based thing that was basically just exactly Light Bike. Like I, where I you... played Light Bike like the uh, arcade cabinet, but I, I never played it on my cell phone. It was popping in my high school at one point. It, speaking of um, phone games, there's a bit where they're kind of floating around, and I feel like, Tommy, maybe you're the only person that would get this reference, but it reminds me a lot of Polyfauna, that Tom York iPhone app. Did you ever play that? I, I vaguely remember that. There's there's scenes where they're, especially on kind of like that weird like sailor thing going through the stratosphere that Ooh. reminded me a lot of Polyfauna. Was that for Tomorrow's Modern Boxes? It was, okay. yeah. Yeah. It was the app that he put out for that. I feel like I never downloaded the app, but like watched video of it. Yeah. there's. Yeah. I mean, it's literally just like you're just in this weird like poly world and then he there's clips of the album that was unreleased in the background that was the entire thing it was pretty gimmicky but it reminded me of Trump. tom york loves a gimmick he loves a gimmick like, like putting tomorrow's mounted boxes on BitTorrent was the only <laughs> behind a paywall was the only way you could get it for a while it's Hilarious. a good album I yeah it's that not bad album. that was that was one that was not a game changer for me but i remember that was like early like mid to early and be getting into synthesizers for the first time. And I was like, this is fucking crazy. I liked it a lot when it came out. It's yeah. been a while since I've listened to it, but I remember really enjoying I it. I think I listened to it earlier this year and it held up. Uh, but it was like a similar thing of like, I don't know how he uses computers to get those noises. 
which I maybe is also like the movie Tron. I don't know how they did a lot of this. Tron, that was a loose, Tron, that was Tron, a loose Tron, tie. Tron York. Tron York. That's it. <laughs> I love how everyone here, except for me, has also seen Tron Legacy. I haven't seen Tron Legacy. Really? Nope. Whoa. Oh, I've man. I've never seen Tron Legacy. Somebody uh, in the 11th grade, so when I was in 11th grade, somebody burned me a disc. I think of Tron Legacy because it had just come out. Like I think they went on the Pirate Bay you know, after it had like just came out in theaters, mm-hmm. uh, and I still haven't seen it. It's been like chilling in all the glove boxes of all my cars. Oh, that's the Tron you have, not this Tron? I think it's Tron Legacy. It's just a it's a burned DVD with the word Tron written like really big and green. I'm oh wow. Like, and it still has taken me thirteen years to even watch the first one. So cool. Well in twenty twenty uh thirty six, let's watch that burnt disc. Yeah, we'll follow up. Yeah. We'll do another podcast. Yeah, I've listened to the soundtrack. Never never seen the movie. I started watching Tron Legacy. I think last last night, two nights ago. At some point, I started watching it and couldn't because I started wor- wor- working on music instead because I was inspired because the soundtrack is so good. But I really do want to go back and listen to the remix album because I remember um, the ch- the church I went to growing up had a big event and they had like this countdown on the screen. I remember they were playing the Derezd remix underneath the mm-hmm. countdown for like the service to start. That's so silly. It was really, really silly, but it felt so badass to me is like, whatever age I was in high school, like the church is playing fucking Daft Punk. This is the, this is the religion for me. That one's like, so check it out. <laughs> Link in the description. I think there, it might be glitch mob. Open up that filter. Let's go. <laughs> Take, takes a sec. Yeah. I guess we also just like end it in. No, I like this. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> wait, wait for it. <laughs> it's dubstep, bro. In this movie. Yeah. It's pretty hot. That's, that's so feel free to listen to that on your own time. <laughs> <laughs> or just or just play this part of the yeah, podcast. Just keep over. listening to that. You can listen to the build and then like two seconds of the drop. <laughs> was any was anybody else into dubstep growing up? Yeah, dude. I was really I had a big phase in high school. I was dubstep in 2011. Did, did anyone else go on this song is com? No. No. That was my it was just like a dubstep hub that you could download songs on and I would always just go to this song is sick.com and I would download the newest like, you know, Zed's Dead remix of something. Sure. I the D-Res remix was like the most like I feel like I remember listening to that and being like, "Whoa, like it felt like they were incorporating dubstep like structure mm-hmm. into like a bigger more commercial song." Yeah. I I wasn't like into dubstep into dubstep but that remix in particular like I definitely had more of a house music phase because there was a dance at my high school called night glow and it was like our version of a rave and I DJ'd it my senior year and I was like guess I have to find electronic music other people like and it was like I think I played that remix at one point was the Derez thing and that was like I thought it was cool and then there's also this remix just to plug another remix I like did you guys ever listen to the Kesha remix album Dude, that we talked about the or you talked to Cheryl about the blow remix. I talked to people about the blow and remix that all was, the time. I, that blow <laughs> remix I had on a burnt CD when I drove a PT Cruiser in high school that had a bumper sticker. I'm proud of my Eagle Scouts and Woman for Obama, and I would blast <laughs> that blow remix like driving down remix. Glencoe. Yeah, it so holds good. up so so good. Well. It's so good. Every t- I remember yeah. I also DJ a little. This is me talking about my DJ career now. I DJed a little bit in college at like uh, fraternity and sorority dances and stuff. And that would be like my secret weapon would pull out the blow remix and people would lose their goddamn minds because they'd be like, oh, wow, Kesha, I like Kesha. And then it would just take this crazy left turn. There's like five drops. Yeah, yeah I'm already showing so you this good. now because I remember every time I'm like, oh, there's another one. <laughs> and it just gets better and better. It's so good. Every every drop gets better than the last. No, the first one's probably the best one. It's like this place so about to and then just everything comes crashing down. I'm going to stop talking about the Blow remix because we are watching Tron. 
What was your DJ name? So I changed it every time. Uh, I, <laughs> the way it, to I, build a fan base. Yeah, I, I didn't care that much, but I, the first time I did it, it was DJ Green T, hashtag rolling up and rolling in that green. Terrible. I was, um, <laughs> I was, I didn't smoke weed at the time. Um, I was DJ Huge Jacked Man at one point. Mm, that's really good. I was de- <laughs> the one that I ended up keeping for like, um, huge, huge Jacked Man. Man. I always call him that. Yeah, I am a huge jacked man. Yeah. Uh, for those of you who haven't seen me in person, the other DJ name that I actually ended up keeping for some rap stuff I produced is DJ Artie Spliff, named after oh. Artie Ziff, the Simpsons character, but Spliff, like the drug. Nice. Those are the three I remember. Also, I love Bit, the like yes, no Bit, which I guess I didn't oh, get yeah. as a kid, but I think that's really funny that it's just like one line of binary it's like yes oh no 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 and i love how much personality it has and um apparently it was coded with like a like one of the first voice synthesizer chips um that is just like this analog circuit board that can synthesize voices called like the the vox vox trek or something um i don't know we look we were looking it up later but I, it's just great i didn't get that joke until now what? But the yes and no. Yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. That's oh, great. You're a bit, right? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Can you say anything else? Yes. No, no, no. I don't know. It's funny. I wish it could. Is that, are those in Tron Legacy at all? No. I feel like that's such a fun little thing that's only in this one scene in the movie that I feel like I would have loved if it just followed him around the entire time. It's like a Jar Jar Binks sort of foil. Like, <laughs> it's just this kind of this great little character. You know who is in Tron Legacy? Killian Murphy. For exactly one line. Yeah, it's insane. I, I, when I, he's in the beginning. When I started watching it yesterday, I was like, "That's not Killian Murphy." And then I googled it, it and is. it says uncredited for two seconds in the very first scene. He plays that tech bro. Have any of you guys seen Metropolis? Yes. I feel like a lot of this sort of animation reminds me of M- M- Metropolis. Like kind of grand art deco influence. Yeah. In some ways. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. Big kind of like gigantic sort of stuff but it's also like very clearly sort of like it still feels 2d in a way that's kind of like again like that Mm -hmm. metropolis feels like a fever dream in the same way that this does movie also kind of about um fascism and yeah class war it's good stuff watch tron watch tron do you have any other big big notes tommy um well first i want to mention uh if you haven't seen it watch season seven (laughs) trias of horror on the simpsons they make there's one line about Tron, and it's really funny. I just want to make sure that everyone watches that Trios of Horror, because it's a good one. Um, so this was a line that I thought was kind of prophetic. Um, the computers and the programs will start thinking, but the people will stop. That's, that's from this movie? That's from this movie. What, what was the context? Do you remember? I don't remember. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> I just wrote down the line and said, oh, that's badass. That's pretty good. Um, I don't I don't know what the context was, but they ain't oh, wrong. Oh, I think it was it when um the old man was like visiting Dillinger, and he was less like my computer program like, and he's just like I built this company out of a garage, and he's like sooner yeah. or later the programs will think and the humans won't. Something like that, yeah. Like, you can go back to your garage. Yeah. Yeah. That can be arranged. Yeah. Do y'all have any any closing thoughts on the movie Tron, nineteen eighty two? Yeah, any big uh, statements on on Tron and your relationship with it? Cheryl's definitely got one. Um, this margarita is pretty good. Woo! Thanks, Dan. Thanks, Dan. It was delicious. I downed that sucker. Um, yeah, Tron's a great movie. Uh, I think it holds up. I think it's it's fun, and viewing it in the lens of like first CG film, awesome. And again, I think even watching it from today's standards, it's just like cool and like artistic and vibey. And Jeff Bridges is hot. What what more do you need? What more do you need? Anything y'all want to plug? We're playing a show with Tommy Kessler for the Rock EP release. Who? Coming up September 14th with Yada Yada and Truth or Consequences, New Mexico. Hell yeah, that sounds like a good show. Yeah. You going to be there, Tommy? Uh, I think about it. Nice. <laughs> yeah, I really enjoyed watching this movie. It's super unique and cool and like has such a unique aesthetic and 
like no no other movie looks like this and feels like it and it's super fun and totally kind of totally inexplicable too in a fun way um so thank you for sharing with us i'm glad i had an excuse to watch it for the first time you're welcome and next in 13 years you'll watch tron legacy yeah we'll see (laughs) if they're feeling up to it if we do another podcast maybe well, I'm pretty certain we're going to be doing this podcast for the next 14 years at least. So thanks for joining us. I'm the Digital Movie Club. Yeah. Watch out for those skeletons. All right, guys. <laughs> Tune into previous episodes if you want that <laughs> reference. <laughs>